So like a thief in the night, while everybody was sleeping under all of our noses, the Supreme Court crept in and ended the eviction moratorium that was set in place by the Biden administration, Joe Biden specifically, um, as an answer to the protest, the sleeping on the uh, steps of the Capitol by Cori Bush, among others. Um, I have a Rolling Stone article in front of me. I want to read a little bit of it to kind of revamp you if you need it on the situation leading up to this and what we're currently dealing with, as well as provide my own interpretation of these events. So the article goes as follows. On August the 3rd, the Delta variant surging, President Joe Biden's administration issued a new 60-day moratorium on evictions in parts of the country with high levels of coronavirus transmission. Um, I want to point out that this eviction moratorium covered about 92% of uh, renters, I believe. The Centers for Disease Control determined that stopping people from being kicked out of their homes was essential to protecting them and their communities from this new and more contagious COVID-19 variant. On Thursday, less than four weeks later, the six conservative justices on the Supreme Court decided they know better than the CDC. In an emergency order issued late last night, the court put a halt to this policy, potentially subjecting millions of people to being displaced in the midst of this raging health crisis. What the Supreme Court did this week was ostensibly in the name of making sure that the executive branch doesn't act beyond its authority to do so. The court's short order explained that if the federal government wants to ban evictions during the pandemic, it needs to do so with a law that is passed by Congress and signed by the president to try to impose a nationwide requirement on almost all landlords purely by CDC rule. The court argued that its unsigned opinion and its unsigned opinion goes against the basic structure of how the federal government is supposed to act. I, and I quote, our system does not permit agencies to act unlawfully, even in pursuit of desirable ends. If a federally imposed eviction moratorium is to continue, Congress must specifically authorize it. Uh, these are several remarkable aspects of this decision. First, the court acted on such an important issue as part of its shadow docket. These are cases that are fast tracked to the Supreme Court and decided without full briefing and without oral argument. In other words, the issues in this case received less attention and thought than issues in normal cases, which is why they were able to slip this up under us in the middle of the night. There are many critics of the court using its shadow docket to decide weighty issues that affect the entire country. The three justices in dissent decried a lack of considering decision making informed by full briefing and argument. But to no avail, the court's majority plowed ahead anyway, quickly and summarily telling the president and the CDC that they cannot protect renters. So I don't really need to read the rest of this article. I think I have um, giving a, given a pretty decent briefing on the situation. So they crept in, as I just alluded to, and ended the eviction moratorium. Now, as we know, Corey Bush, among others, um, essentially with their efforts got this put in place. But as I said, after that occurred, was that that wasn't an adequate solution. And we would be facing this problem again. And in this case, it was sooner, much rather than later, with the Supreme Court, of course, doing this because the eviction moratorium, I believe, was for 60 days and it was supposed to end on October the 3rd. It was put in place on August the 3rd. So that's 60 days. And I don't understand why after that happened, they just kind of said, oh, okay, great, thanks. And took the quote unquote win that they got, it wasn't really even a win in hindsight, and just went to look at other issues instead of coming back to this and saying, no, okay, Joe Biden just gave us a break by implementing this eviction moratorium that I remember at the time he was saying he wasn't even sure would be upheld. And look here, look here, it, it wasn't. But they should have used that time to actually bring legislation before Congress and have a vote on something to try to extend the eviction moratorium and do it in a way where it couldn't be overturned by the corrupted Supreme Court. And I'll get into the awful Supreme Court in just a second, but I can't even direct all of my vitriol towards them because our leaders in Congress have had so much time to deal with this issue and they have so many ways to deal with this issue. Let me read you um, a couple of statistics here. America's 708 billionaires are now worth 4.8 trillion after gaining $1.8 trillion, up 62% during the pandemic. 
That was only the duration of the pandemic. The wealth growth alone could pay for over half of the Democrats' $3.5 trillion budget. And just to give you a little bit of uh, statistics, so Jeff Bezos, on March the 18th of 2020, he was worth $113 billion. As of August the 17th of 2021, he's worth $188 billion. So a 66% growth over the course of 17 months. Then you have Elon Musk was worth $24 billion, March the 18th of 2020. Fast forward to August the 17th, 17th, he's up to $175 billion, up 612%. And I mean, that, I mean, there's a list of statistics like these. And my thing is, we have all of this wealth accumulation to the likes of which we've never seen. And we continuously allow the mass of people in this country to struggle, to struggle as if there's nothing that we can do about it. We bail out Wall Street. We bail out the big corporations like it's nothing. But when it comes to the homeowners, I mean, when it comes to the renters, in this case, we can't do it for them. I mean, what would it take for us to just come in and bail out the renters or bail out uh, the landlords? Give them the money that they're owed. I mean, we've allocated money to the states so that they can uh, pass on to these landlords so that they don't, that, so that they don't uh, evict people. But that money hasn't gone anywhere. It's just sitting around and nobody's doing anything with it. And it's not getting dispersed. And so now we face a looming eviction crisis that's once again has been thrusted right in front of our faces. And they're going to have to deal with it or else millions of people are going to end up on the street. I expect evictions. I mean, evictions are already happening. You know, those people, I mean, these landlords, they were chomping at, at, at the bits to get these people out of their homes and get them out on the streets. And it's incredibly sad. And now I want to take position towards the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court recently, as of a couple months ago, actually did a video on this, ruled in favor of child slavery. Yeah, they did. You You should really look up on that if you have no idea what I'm referencing. Um, I won't get into the specifics of the case, but they did, in fact, do that not too very long ago. And Donald Trump and his administration did an amazing effort on their part in putting in these right wing ideologue judges. I mean, at the last second, putting through Amy Comey Barrett, that was a cherry on top of the uh, Sunday right there. And as we've seen over the course of time, they have pushed their own agenda. They have. I mean, we had the first federal execution in over a decade. I believe it was 17 years. We've had multiple executions by uh, lethal injection, among other things they've done to further their um, insane agendas and ideals. But this is just the latest example. And I made a video about this uh, a while ago about the Lochner era. And I would say that it's safe to say that we have entered a new Lochner era. And if you're not aware of what that is, I'll give you a short briefing. The Lochner era is a period in the American legal history of 40 years, so from 1897 to 1937, in which the Supreme Court of the U.S. is said to have made it common practice to strike down economic regulations adopted by a state based on the court's own notions of the most appropriate means for the state to implement its considered policies. The court did this by using its interpretation of of substantive due process to strike down laws to be infringing on economic liberty or private contract rights. The Lochner era ended when the court's tendency to invalidate labor and market regulations came into direct conflict with Congress's regulatory efforts in the New Deal. That sounds completely frightening. And that's what we're dealing with. I'll give you an example. Imagine somehow by the grace of whatever we get, I don't know, Medicare for all passed, right? Just speaking hypothetically. What if the Supreme Court comes out and says, eh, no, that's unconstitutional. You can't have that. Well, I mean, what is it that they can't do? They can just overturn anything. And it didn't have to be this way. The Democrats didn't have to allow it to be this way. They let Trump and his administration come in and push all of these corrupt judges. And now we have a 6-3 conservative court. And these are all people that went to Harvard and Yale and these esteemed uh, institutions. Right. They don't know the struggle of being out on your ass, not having a job, not having the ability to pay your rent, not having a home. They don't they can't relate to any of these problems. But they're the ones that get to make the decisions. And let me guess, the Democrats, they aren't going to do anything about the court. They aren't going to look to expand it. They aren't going to look to do term limits. 
they aren't going to look through anything. Nothing at all. And this also brings up other problems. What are they doing about the filibuster? I mean, it, it, there's so many things that they're just absent on. And the future looks really bleak for this party. Um, this is democracy in peril. This is a country that is failing the mass of its people. And quite strikingly of all, this is a system that is failing to work for the people that need it the most.